It's March 19, 2006. Opening minutes of an NCAA tournament first round matchup between Army and the heavily favored Tennessee Volunteers. Tennessee's Candace Parker just caught a long outlet pass from Sydney Spencer. She's ahead of the pack and everyone watching anticipates history. Parker looks like she's about to dunk. If she does, that'll be a first for this tournament. How big of a deal is that? To answer, we need to reflect on why a dunk here would make history and what, if anything, it means for basketball and for Parker's burgeoning stardom. We need to rewind. It didn't take long after the invention of basketball for particularly tall and bouncy athletes to realize, hey, I can get up high enough to just cram the ball directly into that 10-foot rim. The United States men's basketball team rolled into Nazi Germany for the 1936 Olympics with a couple players over six foot seven. That included Frank Lubin, and it included Joe Fortenberry, who's considered the first player ever to dunk in an organized game. Those tall Americans wrecked all competition to win gold. The sore losers insisted future competitions set a height limit for players. Which leads us to the simple fact that dunking has had its detractors over the years particularly in college, where coaches get super horny for fundamentals. Kansas coaching legend Fog Allen once argued dunking required no skill, just height, and proposed raising the rim above 10 feet. Huh. That matches one of the reasons behind a 1967 NCAA ban on dunking. Another supposed reason was injury concerns, but plenty suspected the real reason for the ban was Lou Alcindor the skyscraping UCLA center you now know as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem wrote about the ban in his autobiography years later and expressed unequivocally that he found it racist. But at the time, even his own coach, John Wooden, seemed fine with the rule. Kareem went the rest of his college career without dunking. He and the Bruins did okay in spite of that. Other players, like NC State's David Thompson, couldn't resist the rim forever. He accepted a technical foul for throwing down in his final college home game. Both Kareem and Thompson dunked plenty as pros and participated in dunk contests, which served as a reminder that, hey, uh, actually, dunks are great. The college game lifted its ban in the late 70s. Jamming a basketball is effective. It absolutely does require skill, it looks cool, and it hasn't ruined the sport. So almost no one makes a big deal out of dunks these days, but right now, everyone's on edge to see if Parker gets rim. Women have been playing basketball in its variations just as long as men, but the documented history of women dunking begins more recently for a few reasons. One is disparity in average size and vertical leaping ability. And even among men, dunking is the purview of the 99th percentile, those of extreme size or ability. Average men cannot dunk. Except me. That's not the whole deal, though. History's women of extreme size and ability were deprived the training, encouragement, and incentive the men got, the kind of coaching that turns an athlete into a dunker. The pipeline for American women in particular to pursue basketball has long been leaky and convoluted. When girls basketball flourished in places like Iowa in the 1920s, physical educators endeavored to shut down tournaments. In the 1940s, Alice Coachman was a gifted leaper who thrived for the Tuskegee basketball team. But like other black girls, she was pushed away from basketball because AAU tournaments were practically whites only, and the Olympics offered no basketball event for women. Coachman became a legendary high jumper, but said she was just as good at basketball. Women were expected to display the appropriate amount of physicality and intensity, and only in ways that didn't compromise their femininity. Racists and homophobes took it upon themselves to police the physiques of female players. Tall, strong players like 6'1 Nera White got harassed. In the 50s, North Carolina administrators actively tanked local girls' tournaments because women weren't meant to be competitors and because they were diverting interest away from the boys. Even after the historic Title IX decision barred colleges from discriminating on the basis of sex, athletic departments squeezed budgets for women's athletic programs, and the NCAA spent much of the 70s lobbying against the decision, whining about what basic fairness might do to men's programs. 
The league didn't start a women's postseason tournament until 24 years ago, 1982, and did so by strong-arming the grassroots AIAW tournament. Numerous women's programs took hits during the Reagan and Bush administrations, when it became much easier for universities to shirk their Title IX obligations. So let's be clear. If women had the same opportunities as men, the most gifted among them would have been dunking all along. Instead, female players got discouraged because they were stealing attention from the boys, or because their bodies were too powerful, or because their schools withheld funding. All that said, here in 2006, it looks like a woman's about to dunk. So let's talk about the history of that. Women be slamming. They have been for a while. Cheryl Miller, one of the greatest basketball players ever, dazzled fellow high schoolers in the 70s by dunking, just to show the guys she could hang with them. That's even though Miller stands just six foot one and at least as a teenager, could not palm a basketball. Reports at the time stated there were no documented distaff dunkers. That would soon change. In February of 1984, 6'7 West Virginia center George Ann Wells threw down with two hands and a full-sized ball in a game against UMass, but refs waved off the basket because of a foul call. No matter, the very next season, Wells did it again against the University of Charleston, cramming the new, slightly smaller women's ball with one hand. The Charleston Athletic Department buried video of their posterization, but thanks to dogged Wall Street Journal reporting, here we can see Wells receiving a long outlet pass, then clearly putting one down in the open court. Everyone reacts accordingly. Outside that gym, the reaction was curious. Wells kept dunking and gained some national acclaim for it. The experts weighed in. NC State legend Kay Yao pointed out how often the men's game was used as a reference point to diminish the women's game, yet here was one more supposedly male skill that women proved they could do too. Tennessee and Olympic head coach Pat Summit warned of that comparison, insisting that the women's game was exciting on its own merits, with or without dunking. Both valid points, though they weren't always so artfully made. Here's an article from 1989 in which the male coach of the Louisiana Tech women's team says there aren't enough great women athletes to entertain the public, that God didn't make enough women with the necessary abilities, and that there aren't even any women dunking in games. There had been at least one, of course, but George Ann Wells' own coach noted that when her center was dunking, fans would show up to watch her do that, then leave as soon as she checked out of the game. So. No dunking was bad, but some dunking created the risk of a sideshow. And all this in the context of sometimes performative concern that people weren't showing up to watch the game. All that pressure left one path forward, articulated by coaching legend C. Vivian Stringer, to rip that barrier open wide enough that women's basketball could boast numerous dunkers. People are gonna decide to watch or they aren't. No straw man, no sideshow. Well, here came the dunkers. In 1992, rising superstar Lisa Leslie dunked in an Olympic scrimmage. In 96, she was discouraged from doing so in a game because it might be a distraction. In 1993, 5'10 high school track and basketball star Marion Jones claimed she could dunk. Jones went on to play ball at UNC where several of her teammates routinely dunked in warmups. Here's six-foot Charlotte Smith, a niece of David Thompson, doing precisely that with one hand. Smith would go on to dunk in a game, but she's much better known for hitting the jump shot that won the Tar Heels the 94 NCAA title at the buzzer. Smith was way more than a dunker, but her verticality did inspire others. She gave first-hand training and encouragement to Michelle Snow. Here's one of several dunks Snow put down as Tennessee's center of the early 2000s, a clean two-hander off a of steal. Charlotte Smith's UNC teammate, Sylvia Crawley, would later salute the crowd, then convert blindfolded to win an all-female dunk contest hosted by the short-lived American Basketball League. And the pro league that overtook the ABL, the WNBA, got its first dunk in 2002, courtesy of Leslie leaking out in transition. The pipeline is now flowing. Tootie Reed of Rutgers is well under six feet tall, but she can dunk. 6'6 LSU center Sylvia Fowles has shown an array of dunks in practice, and everyone expects one in-game soon. Same goes for the best high school player in the country, Tina Charles. So what's the big deal? Well, 
for one, dunking hasn't quite reached the critical mass that it's not noteworthy. For two, this is a bigger stage. This is the nationally televised NCAA tournament, which has never seen a dunk on the women's side. For three, this is Candace Parker. Parker is the daughter of a former men's college player and the sister of an active men's pro player, Anthony Parker. Parker became a national superstar at Naperville High School. She won two state titles, earned all kinds of Player of the Year awards, and for our purposes, dunked in a game when she was just 15 years old. In 2004, just months after returning from ACL surgery, the Tennessee-bound Parker competed in the McDonald's All-American High School Dunk Contest against a field of all boys, including soon-to-be NBA players like Josh Smith and J.R. Smith. Parker dunked along the baseline, dunked after going around her back, and in the finale did her version of the classic D. Brown no-look dunk. That last one got a 10 from all the judges but Barry Sanders, who gave it a 9. Yes, that Barry Sanders. Anyway, Parker won the contest. Parker was one of the shortest players competing, was jumping off a recently repaired knee ligament, and crucially, didn't miss as many dunks as her competitors, but of course, people crowed that she'd won the contest just because she was a woman. Men like Jason Whitlock came out of the woodwork to chastise the PC police and Parker for degrading herself and the women's game by breaking that barrier. And yet, yeah, it's possible that in the eyes of the judges, the novelty and circumstance of Parker dunking eclipsed, say, the artistry of JR tapping the backboard on his way up. But in a way, that was the point. Parker expressed afterward her hope that in 10 years, multiple girls would enter that contest, that the novelty would wear off. That applies directly to her, too. The first time Parker dunked, it was news. Now it's just a footnote to her already storied career. After a redshirt freshman year, Parker was this season named an All-American and SEC Rookie of the Year, plus SEC Tournament MVP for a performance that included this game-winning shot in the final. Candace Parker's got a lot going on besides dunks. And that's basically the story here. After some controversial history, the dunk is a fun and ordinary part of men's basketball. Women's basketball history isn't so straightforward. Throughout the 20th century, the powers that be squashed the ambition and opportunity of female athletes who might have otherwise been slamming and jamming. Now, plenty of women have dunked, but a few rims remain untouched, like those of this NCAA tournament. The player attacking this rim is so much more than a dunker. She wants that part of her game, of the game, to be commonplace. Here, she has a chance to bust open one more door so that others may pass through without a fuss. A chance to make basketball history so that others may simply play basketball. We know what Candace Parker can do. Let's watch her do it. Welcome to a moment in history. Thinking about a dunk, there it is! She has set the tone early and the throw down in transition. Parker actually dunked again in that game, but Tennessee lost to UNC in the Elite Eight. Thanks a lot for watching Rewinder, and if you want to see more episodes, check these out or like and subscribe to SB Nation. Do both, honestly.